through it, okay? So the first problem is actually from the very, very beginning, it does go pretty much in order from the first unit to the second unit and then to the third unit as we move down. So in this one, it's asking us to write the partial fraction decomposition. And then it says, check your result algebraically. Again, I didn't do that when I was doing my work. I should have, but I didn't. Um, but at the same time, you could have also just combined all of these into one fraction, right? And then you should hopefully end up with this fraction here, okay? So I'm just talking because there's some people that like to do the problems backwards. They like to look at the answers and decide which answer is the answer instead of just working out the problem, okay? So you can do that on the final. No one's gonna know, okay? <laughs> How are they gonna know? They're not gonna know. <laughs> and if your MIT paperwork has stuff on it that I can add, then I'll add it, okay? Um, if for some reason you get it wrong. So this was the problem that they started with. And the first thing that I recognized is that the, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. And what I mean by is the highest exponent in the numerator is gonna be smaller than the highest exponent in the bottom. And it might not look like that right now, but as soon as I distribute this x squared, what does this term become? It becomes x squared times x is what? X cubed, right? So I have an x squared at the top, but an x cubed at the bottom, okay? So that's why my bottom part, my bottom degree is bigger than my top degree. Okay, and why did I write this? Because I have to have a smaller exponent on the top in order for me to even do this process, okay? If you notice the next problem, it's already multiplied out and does the top have a smaller degree? The top has a bigger degree than that one, right? So then because it's bigger, I had to do long division first, okay? So that's the big difference of why I'm mentioning that, okay? Basically, is it proper or improper, right? This one's a proper fraction with the top exponent being smaller. The other one is improper with the top exponent being bigger, okay? But once I know this, I can start breaking it up. Now, there are two ways to look at this. So I only, um, I wanted to mention that, okay? It's whether or not you see this as a quadratic and then a linear. Or if you see this as a linear, just the x being squared like this, okay? So depending on how you see this denominator will tell you which way to break it up, okay? Because we know that when we have linear factors squared, we have to write the linear factor by itself first and then we can write it with the square. And then I write the other linear factor, but this linear factor doesn't have a square, right? So it just gets once. If it did have a square, it'd have another one with the square at the bottom. Versus over here, when you look at it as a quadratic, anytime you have a quadratic denominator, you have to have a linear expression in the numerator, okay? So linear expressions will have constants, quadratic expressions will have linears at the top, basically one degree less every single time, okay? Now, it doesn't matter which one of those two that you take, because both of these, when I start multiplying by the common denominator, they will both give me this equation here. So if I took this equals this expression, this fraction equals these two, and I were to multiply everybody by the common denominator x squared plus one, the x squared would cancel here, the x plus one would cancel here, leaving me with just that numerator. For this factor, the x squared would cancel, but I'd be left with the ax plus b times the x plus one. And then here, the x plus one would cancel, but I'd be left with the c times the x squared, right? Now, if I did the same thing, but with this equation, with this on the left side and this on the right side, when I multiply by that common denominator, these guys are still gonna wipe out, aren't they? And so I'm still gonna have this expression. But over here, only one of the x's will wipe out, leaving me with the other x and the x plus one. Here, both of the x's will cancel, but I'll still have b times the x plus one, 
And here, the x plus one will cancel, but I'll still have c times x squared. And notice that those are the exact same thing. I took ax and I multiplied it by that, and that's the expression I have here. And then b times this is written there, okay? And so you essentially get the same thing no matter which way you look at it, okay? Now, once it's like that, I just kind of went ahead and distributed my AX, got these two guys, and then I distributed my B, and I got these two guys, and then I collected all the ones that were like terms, okay? So notice I have AX squared and CX squared. So I put the X squared on the outside, and I put the coefficients A plus C on the inside, okay? Then over here, I have AX and BX. So I put the X on the outside and I put those coefficients on the inside. And then the constant is there's only one constant and it's B. So then that essentially creates your system of equations. This coefficient for X squared should equal that coefficient, which is five. And then this coefficient for X should equal that coefficient, which is three. And then this constant should be the same as that constant, which means B is negative one. Okay, and then knowing that B is negative one, I can plug it right there and then solve for A. And I figure out that A is four. And then I can plug in A equal to four right here. And then I can figure out what C is. So I plugged in the four minus it over and I got C. Okay, now that I know what all three letters are, I'm gonna put them in their place. Now, it looks like I did both of them. So I did this one. So the A was four, I put the four. The B was negative one, so I put the negative one. And the C was positive one, so I put it there. And then if I was doing this one, I did the four, the negative one, and then the one, right? But I noticed that in the choices, in choices, it looked like this, okay? But both of these are equivalent to this one. Because if I do four X over X squared and I reduce an X, I get this term. And then if I do plus negative one over X squared, it's just minus over X squared. And then that guy's the same. And here it's already pretty much the same. It's just, what do you get when you do plus a negative? It becomes a minus, right? And so those both of them, regardless of which way you were looking at it, they both come out exactly the same, okay? This will equal the right answer. It sucks that the long ones are in the front, but they are. <laughs> These are the long problems, okay. This one's very similar. The, there's a huge difference at the beginning, and that's because the top exponent is bigger, right, than the bottom's biggest exponent. So the top big guy is bigger than the bottom big guy, okay? So this three and that two means that I have to do long division first. So I put all of the numerator inside the bars, and then I put the denominator outside. And then on the side, you're only looking at the first terms, okay? So the inside term goes on the top, the outside term is on the bottom, because that's what you're dividing by, right? And then when I reduce that, I just got x, so that's where this guy came from. Once you have a number up here or anything up there, you distribute it to all of these and place the results under. So x times each one of these guys gave me x cubed, x squared, and negative 20x but I need to subtract all three of these, okay? So I change the signs, and to me, I like to put little circles around them so I know which one's the one I'm supposed to be looking at, okay? So this positive x cubed becomes a negative, this positive becomes a negative, and then this negative becomes a positive, right? And so I have x cubed minus x cubed, which means they go away. Negative two x squared minus an x squared means I have negative three x squared. And then negative 14x plus 20x gives me that positive 6x. And then this guy just comes down, okay? Then I go on to the next, I basically repeat everything all over again, right? Take this first guy and divide it by that first guy. And so I did that over here on the side. Negative 3x squared divided by x squared is just a negative three. So that's where this negative three at the top came from, okay? Right here, and it goes up there. Then I distribute that negative three to all three of the terms on the outside. So I get negative three X squared, I get negative three X, and then I get a positive 60. But I need to subtract all of those. So this one turns positive, this one turns positive, and this one turns negative. 
negative 3x squared plus 3x squared wipe each other out. Positive 6x plus 3x gives me 9x. And then positive 48 minus 60 gives me negative 12. So I rewrote the fraction. Remember when you rewrite the fractions, it's always quotient plus remainder over divisor. So it's your quotient. This is quotient. Plus the remainder over divisor. Okay, and then this is your remainder. And regardless if you're looking here or here, both of these guys are your divisor. Okay, so all of that will be labeled in there. And that's exactly what I did. I took the X minus three in the front, put a big plus sign, took this remainder, put it on the top, and then took this divisor and put it at the bottom. Okay, only this fraction part is the part that I have to decompose. Okay, this will be part of the answer. And if you look at the choices, you'll realize that all of them have X minus three. I'll go to it real quick. See, not all of them, this one doesn't. So you know that one's wrong, but all of these guys do have the X minus three, don't they? Okay. And so then it's just a matter of well, which one of these other things is it, okay? So let's go through that process again. Now here, I did factor the denominator um, and it's just, x plus five and x minus four, if you factor that. And so it's just two linears. So, oh, here I am, right here. I'm looking down there and I shouldn't be. Here we are. So I took this and I factored that denominator. They're both linear. So I'm just gonna have a constant over one of the linears plus a constant over the other linear. Now the common denominator here for this fraction, for this equation, is both, right? X plus five and X minus four. So when I multiply them here, they both cancel, giving me just the nine X minus 12. When I multiply them both, I'm just left with A times X minus four. And here the X minus fours will cancel, but I'll be left with E times X plus five. I went ahead and distributed that one and that one, and then I grouped them. So I put the X's together and then the coefficients in front and then these two are both constant. So I just literally wrote them next to each other in a parentheses, okay? But that helps me to figure out what the system is. So this coefficient, whatever it is, needs to equal nine. So that's where the top equation came from. And then this constant, whatever that is, needs to equal negative 12, okay? And so then I can solve this, whichever method you want. If you like substitution, you could do that. I like elimination. So I just basically multiplied this by four, so it would cancel with the negative eight. So I did 4a, 4b, and then 36. I multiplied everybody by four. And then I got 9b and a 24, divided both sides by nine, and so I ended up with this fraction, right? Now, that's just one variable. So once I have that one variable, I do have to go back and plug it in. Now, I think it was to plug it into the top one. So I plugged in the B, I moved this over, and I ended up with 19 over 3, okay? So now I'm going to rewrite this here, but with the correct A and B that I found, right? So A I found was 19 over 3, and the B I found was 8 over 3. Now, because they both have denominators in the numerator, I factored that whole fraction piece out of the numerator. So I factored out this one third to the front, that way all I could have was the 19 and the eight in the numerator, okay? Once I had that, um, I noticed that they had them backwards. They had the X minus four in the front and the X plus five in the back. So I basically just took these two and then swapped them, right? So the eight goes here and the 19 over X plus five goes there. And then that matched what they had. The only thing is, is the full answer should have the X minus three in it, right? So you should have that original X minus three from up here and then the decomposition for that, which is this, okay? And the one that matched all of that information was C. So we have positive, positive, and then eight over X minus four.
positive. Nope. These two are positive, but it's missing the X minus three. These two are positive, and that's my guy. These don't even have eight, right? So those are not it. Sorry, those are the long ones. <laughs> we finally get to get into some of the ones that are not so lengthy. Okay. Those are super lengthy. They're probably like the longest problems. I don't think any other problem is that long. The only other problems that I think take a little bit more time is the ones that where you have to graph them. Okay, those might take a little bit. Okay, so number three is asking me to find the length of the arc. That's a super easy formula. I do have all this information on my paper. So I did put that the radius was 27 inches and that the theta was 100 degrees like it was in the box. Um, and then you just have to remember your um, arc length formula. Your arc length formula does equal the radius times the theta. Only thing is that this must be in radians. Okay, that's the only like trick right there is that the angle must be in radians. So if we're talking about 100 degrees, we need to convert that over into radians first before we can get the formula. Okay. So in order to do that, you just put degrees in the denominator, it's equivalency up top, right? And then the degrees will cancel and you'll be left with radians. And it just so happens that 100 pi over 180 turns out to reduce to five lines, pi, okay? And I just did that in my calculator. I did 100 pi over 180 and it told me five lines pi, okay? Um, once I know that that ends in radians, I'm just gonna do my radius times that number. And I typed this whole thing in the calculator and it spat out 15 pi. And I think there's only one answer with 15 pi, but in case there's two and you want the right decimal, just do 15 pi and then hit the double arrow and it'll give you the decimal, okay? Okay, this one is not too bad. Let's see what those directions are for number four. Number four says, select the right triangle corresponding to the trigonometric function of the acute angle theta. Use the Pythagorean theorem to determine the third side and then find the other five functions. So by now, I'm pretty sure y'all all remember these things, right? Hopefully. <laughs> I think if you take anything out of this class, make sure you do that. <laughs> um, and then that you know how to use the calculator and go between decimals. I mean, degrees and radians and all that. That's probably the good stuff you're going to take with you on to calculus. All the other stuff is just literally torture, I swear. <laughs> so let's keep going. I had to do it too. So <laughs> just pass it on the torch. <laughs> Okay, so we have tan theta equal to three fourths, and we know that for tangent, that's opposite over adjacent. Okay, so when I build my little uh, triangle over here, I just need to make sure that the opposite is a three and the adjacent is the four. And then I did do the um, Pythagorean theorem to figure out the hypotenuse. Since I am looking for the hypotenuse, I do put a plus, right? If you're looking for one of the legs, you would have the hypotenuse squared minus the one leg you know, right? But for hypotenuse, we do plus. So this turns out to square root of 25, which is five. So now I know my hypotenuse. And then if I wanna know all of these, it's just opposite over hypotenuse. So that's three over five, adjacent over hypotenuse. So four over five, so on and so forth, right? For all of them, okay? And the one that had all of these values the same and the correct, I think all of them have the correct triangle, but the one that had the correct numbers for every single one of these guys was option A. Okay, look very, very, very carefully, okay? Because some of these problems you can look at and you'll know the answer, okay? But if you select the wrong one and you never wrote anything down in your paper, I can't give you any points back, right? So just make sure that you're looking real careful because some of them look real close to each other. So look, don't try to rush and just circle something and move on, okay? Really pay attention to those choices. Okay, number five, what is number five? Number five is a word problem. So it says you are skiing down a mountain with a vertical height of 1,250 feet. And then the distance from the top of the mountain to the base is 2,500 feet. What is the angle of elevation from the base to the top of the mountain? 
So this was the image that I drew. You can imagine this like as the mountain, right? If I were to continue the rest of the triangle, but the vertical height is 1250. And then from the top of the mountain to the base is the 2500. And then it tells me that this angle of elevation right here from the ground up to that um, line there is the theta. And so the only operation that I could use using these two, notice that this is opposite and hypotenuse, right? So if I wanna use the opposite over the hypotenuse, that's actually the sine function. So I just did the 1250 over the 2500 equal to the sine. This reduces to one half. And then I took the um, inverse sine of that one half and I got 30 degrees. But I, it cut me off. Oh, because my paper's not there. Um, I noticed that all of the answers were in radians. So I just converted that to degrees real quick, or I'm sorry, converted the degrees to radians. So I 30 times pi over 180, and it gives me pi over six, okay? So I just gotta convert it real quick. Now, let's see what number six looks like. Pretty sure I just copied that from um, whatever was on the paper, but let's see. Oh yeah. So I just recreated this little picture, this little triangle. But since it told me up here that X was equal to 200 feet, I did go ahead and write 200 feet down here, okay, on my paper. But I do have that this is the W and this is 200 and then this angle is 54 degrees. But they wanna know how wide the river is. So what they're asking you for is that W side, okay? So here's my little triangle. I wrote the W over here between two banks, right? I wrote the 200 feet down there and of course the 54 degrees in there. Now notice this time my angle, I can see the opposite side and I can see the adjacent side, right? So I did opposite over adjacent, which is tangent. Well, the opposite is W, the adjacent is 200, and the theta is 54 degrees. So if I wanna solve for W, I just multiplied by the 200 and I got this. I typed all of this in my calculator and it gave me that answer, okay? And that actually fit um, choice E. Okay. Some more triangles, lots of triangles on this one. Um, number seven, what does it say? Number seven says, determine the exact values of the three trigonomic functions, just be specific, okay? Cosecant, secant, and cotangent. And it tells me that this is a negative A value because I'm in this quadrant, right? And a negative B value because I'm in, again, the same quadrant. So. They do tell me what A and B are, but because of where it's located, it's actually a negative three and a negative four, right? And so I redrew it here, but with the negative four for the Y value and the negative three for the X value, okay? Now this is not the actual theta because that's the theta, right? But there's a reference theta right here, okay? I did do my uh, Pythagorean theorem to go ahead and figure out what that hypotenuse was gonna look like. And then I can do those three trig functions. So I did the hypotenuse over the opposite for cosecant. So where is that? Hypotenuse over the opposite, which is this guy. And it just comes out to negative five fourths. Hypotenuse over adjacent. So hypotenuse over the adjacent comes out to negative five thirds and then adjacent over opposite. We get this, but it turns it to positive, right? And that one happens to match A. Now, this one basically asked me to find what? I think it asked me to find sine and secant. Let me make sure. Yeah, so this one says 10 is equal to negative four thirds, but sine is greater than zero, okay? And it wants me to find secant, sine and secant of theta. So I went ahead and wrote this down. I know that tangent is the y value over the x value, okay? It's the y over the x. Now, but they're telling me that sine is greater than zero. I also know that sine means the y value, okay? 
So if sine means the y value, then that means that y has to be greater than zero. And if y is greater than zero, then that negative needs to go to the denominator, doesn't it? Okay. So that means that the x value is going to be the negative guy. Okay. And why? Because in quadrant two, your y is positive and your x is negative. Okay. Um, now I'm going to do my, I drew it in this quadrant two. And I do know that the x is going to be negative and the y is going to be positive. I did my, hypo, my Pythagorean theorem to figure out this side. And then it's just a matter of finding secant and sine. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So four over five. And then secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So hypotenuse over adjacent. And we get this guy. And I think that matched B. Positive four fifths and negative five fifths. Okay. So let's see here. Number nine. This one's not, it gives us the equation and it just asks us for the amplitude and the period, okay? So remember here, whatever number is in the front, that is your amplitude unit. And even if it's negative, you just take the positive of it, but that tells you the amplitude, okay? Then here, this number that's in front of X is the omega. So omega is just four over five. And if you want to figure out the period, you need to do two pi over that omega. So two pi over four fifths. I typed all of that in my calculator and it gave me five pi over two. Okay. And that is one of the options. So I was done. Now, number 10, I think that one's a little bit more involved. I'm going to move this. It's annoying me. There we go. So it says, assign, write an equation for the function that is described by the given characteristics. So the first thing is, is they tell me it is a sine curve. They tell me that the period is pi units. They say that the amplitude is four and that the right phase shift is pi over two. And finally, that there's a vertical translation up by seven. Already, just from that part that I have highlighted in blue, you should already know that this is the answer just from that one piece of info, okay? The amplitude is four, which is that number that's in front of sine. But how the heck would I figure this out? I'll talk about it on the paper. So this is what any sine wave would look like. You're gonna have an omega, you're gonna have X, and you're gonna have this phase shift here, whatever that is. And then this is your vertical translation. If it goes up, it's positive, And if it goes down, it's negative, okay? And your amplitude is there. They did tell me that the period was pi, which means that two pi over omega should equal pi. And if I multiply both sides by omega, I get that two pi equals pi times omega. Then I divided by pi to solve for omega. And I figured out that omega equals two. The amplitude they gave me, they told me it was four, which means that that A value is gonna be a four. The phase shift said it was going to the right. If it's going to the right, it needs to be a negative. Okay, if it were going to the left, then that would be a positive number. Okay, same thing for the vertical shift. It went up, so it's a plus value, a positive value for C. But if it went down, the C would be a negative value. Okay? And so then putting that all together, you put the A where it belongs, you figure out that the omega is two, it's right there. You have X, you have your negative phase shift right there, and then your vertical part. Now, all I did was bind these double neck, the double signs into one sign and distribute this too. So when I did that, I got two X and then I just got pi. And then I noticed that they had this constant in the front. Doesn't make a difference. I just put this positive seven in the front and then plus this positive four sign of two X minus pi. And now it matches B in the test, okay? This is the one that takes forever. I think it just tells you to graph it. So it says select the graph and include two full periods. Okay, and it gives you this function here. Um, so to me, what we do, well, the first thing I do is I figure out what the amplitude is so I can have an idea. And I definitely need to figure out the period or to come up with the table. Okay, 
So when I figure out the period, it's going to be 2 pi over omega. And in this case, omega is pi. Okay, so 2 pi over pi is just 2, which means that I'm going to have a whole um, cycle from just 0 to 2. Okay, but it wants two cycles. So I just did on the other side, the negative, right? Two units going this way. So two units go away to get one, and then two units going into the negative direction to get the other one. Now, in order for me to come up with these values, how do I know to use these values in chart? Okay, what you do is you take your period over four, always. Okay, my period for this problem was a two. So when I divide it by four, I get a half. This is what I'm going to use to get my five key points. Start at zero and then just keep adding a half. So zero plus a half is equal to a half. One half plus another half is equal to one. One plus another half is equal to three halves. And then three halves plus another half is equal to two. Okay. And so that's where all these X's come from. All I did was plug these X's into the function to get the corresponding Y values. Okay. There was an issue though. You don't have a cosecant button on your calculator. Okay or button on your calculator. So what I had to do is I had to remember that cosecant is the same as one over sine of pi x. So it's the same thing as doing four over sine of pi x. And so I plugged all these numbers into that. I had four over sine of pi times zero for the first one. And it told me error, so I knew that this was undefined. Then I went back and I typed in the one half. Oops, that did not come out right. What was it? Pi times fraction, one over two. Close it. And get, oh, I know what's problem. I'm typing in radians, aren't I? <laughs> My calculator is in degree mode. So make sure you change your modes. That's probably going to be the biggest thing. Now I'm going to try that again. Now that makes more sense because <laughs> I have four here, right? Okay, then I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to plug in one and it'll turn out to be undefined. I'll do it again and I'll change that to a three. And it'll finally give me a number. And then when I change this to a two, it'll tell me undefined again, okay? When you have undefined, that's where you're going to have a vertical asymptote, okay? everywhere you get the undefined. So notice that at zero, I have this pink vertical asymptote. At one, I have a pink vertical asymptote. And at two, I have a pink vertical asymptote, okay? And then at one half, I have that positive four. And at three halves, I have that negative four, okay? And if you kind of remember what the cosecants and, co and the secants look like, they look like parabolas going upward and downward all over the place, right? This one tells me that it's gonna go like that. And then this one tells me it's gonna go like that. All I did to get the other side is just repeat same process over here, okay? So notice the point is over here, this point is over here, and the same parabolas are right there, okay? So all I did was just continue the pattern for the negative X values. Literally just took that, took a picture and put it there, right? Okay. So one more, this one's a secant one. So you're probably gonna have one of those two, right? If I'm covering two of these graphing things, you're probably most likely gonna have one of them. The same with the partial fractions. There were two of those problems, right? So most likely you're gonna have a partial fraction problem. You just don't know which one, the one where you have to do the long division or the one where you didn't, okay? Um, so for this one, I did the exact same thing. I took the period, which was the value of that number, which was two, I'm sorry, that's the amplitude, wrong word, amplitude. <laughs> then the period is two pi over omega. And in this case, the omega is that two right there. So when I reduce that, I just get that the period is five. Remember, you have to take your period over four. This number does not change, okay? You're creating four little intervals there. So, I divided by four and I got this. So I started with zero, then I added pi over four to get this one. Then I added pi over four to that to get this one. I added pi over four to that one to get this and added pi over four to that last one to get the pi, okay? 
And that's how you get all five key X values. And then I plug them in. But just like cosecant, you cannot put secant in your calculator. So what I did is I did negative two times one over cosine of two X, and then this plus two on the side. And then I just put these two together to make this fraction, right? So this is what I'm using when I type all of these numbers in the calculator, okay? Um, when I do type all of those guys in the calculator, I end up with zero, undefined, four, undefined, and zero. So we already know this is a vertical asymptote and this is a vertical asymptote. So at pi over four, we have a vertical asymptote and pi, pi over four, we have a vertical asymptote. This is all I have so far, zero to pi. Then I know I have the point zero, zero. I know I have the point uh, pi over two and four, and I know I have the point pi and zero, these three points, right? Um, but I also know what the graph is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be a bunch of parabolas, right? Some going up and some going down. So since this is up here, I know that that's the parabola that goes upward. And then this one's here, I know that that one goes downward. But this one's chopped off, isn't it? Okay, so I do know that it goes downward on this side, just like that one did, because they always toggle one down, one up, one down, one up the whole way. I just finished the other half and then I literally mirrored this over. So notice that if I fold my paper, it will land onto itself, right? This thing is completely mirrored. It had to finish this one out, but the next one should be going upward, right? So I copied that one. And then after the upward one, the next one should be going downward, right? So I copied this one again. And if I wanted, the next one would be going upward and then downward and so on and so forth, okay? So I just repeated the pattern for the negative values, okay? And the one graph that looks like that one is option B. Okay, number 13. I think the biggest thing you need to know about these problems is how to put it in the calculator. Once you know how to put that in a calculator, you should be able to pick a graph that matches. Um, 13 says to write theta as a function of x. So they give you this diagram and they even tell you the altitude of this plane. So they give you this measurement for this distance here, okay? And all I did was repeat that same triangle without the little imagery, but you have the X here, you have the theta there, and then you have that that's a six mile altitude, right? And so it wants you to write an expression for theta. So I do notice that the two sides that I'm given with respect to this is the adjacent side and the opposite side. And I know that opposite over adjacent is equal to tangent. So we took the opposite side, which was six, and the adjacent side, which was X, and that should equal 10 of the angle. Now, if I wanna know what the angle equals, then this has to go to the other side, but it turns into the inverse, right? So when it does go to the other side, it becomes the inverse and now this expression. This is the same thing as saying arc 10, right? Even if I have a little negative one, that's the same as doing arc 10. And so arc 10 is what's in the choices. <coughs> so I brought my water. Okay, so this one, I had some people do this one on the test and you literally just used the calculator and you got the answer. So that's one of those ones that could be pretty quick on the test, okay? If you just type this whole thing in there, you do get the correct answer. Tangent of sine inverse of five over 13. Oops, close and close. And I hit the fraction button and it tells me five over 12, okay? So I use the calculator, but if you wanted to know how to do it without the calculator, you basically say that all of this is gonna equal some kind of angle. And if I move sine over here, it becomes a regular sign, which creates a triangle, right? Once you know that missing sign, you can take the tangent, which is the opposite over the adjacent. And I get the same five twelfths, okay? This is just a long way. Yes, that's a definition. Uh huh. One has the inverse, so when you move it over, it becomes regular. Yeah. And if it's regular and you move it over, it becomes the inverse. What is this? 
Oh, this one's a solving the triangle. Some of these things I got mixed up um, because you've learned more things, right? As we've gone through the semester. So some of the stuff that we were doing for the right triangles, um, we were doing it like these long ways. And once we learned like law of sines and law of cosines, sometimes those methods were faster to get the answers than doing it the old way that we had been doing it, okay? So there's another problem that's gonna come up ahead. Where is it? This ugly problem right here with the two triangles. It's a mess. This one's horrible. <laughs> I'm gonna try my best. I tried to use color to help me explain, but I'll explain in a minute, okay? But this problem, I can't even remember how we solved it. And I was too lazy to go look it up. So <laughs> I just did it doing the law of signs and it came out, okay? But I noticed that we did do this problem a different way back in the day, but it was a whole lot longer what we were doing back then, okay? And it, to me, it was way more confusing than what I did here, okay? But since you do know law of signs, there's no harm in using it when, if you can, okay? So this one does ask me to solve the triangle. So I can find this B pretty fast, right? We just do 180 minus the 90 degree angle and minus the 30 degree angle. And we figure out that B is 60 degrees. And then I went ahead and used um, tangent just because tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. And that would help me figure out A, right? And then I think I could probably, oh no, I could have also found C instead of A, but in, in that case, I would have had to have done adjacent and the hypotenuse, which would have been cosine, right? And the hypotenuse would have been cosine. But I did use this information. I multiplied both sides by 12. And so I figured out that A was this, type that in my calculator in degree mode, and it did pop out 6.93. Then once I knew what that side was, I just did the Pythagorean theorem to figure out C. So I did that one squared plus that one squared. I got this in the calculator and then it was that as a decimal, okay? I did use the exact value. I did not use that. So I'm gonna show you how I did that. I did 12 tangent of 30, but I'm not in the right mode. So I did do that one and I got this. And if you double arrow it, you get this number, okay? But when I plugged it in over here, I did not do 6.93 squared. What I did was, as I did the square root of this thing squared plus 12 squared. And then it gives you this value and it gets you pretty darn close, right? Okay. If you wanted to get this one, you would have had to have typed in the four square root of three. So if I would have done the square root of four square root of three squared plus 12 squared, then it pops eight square root of three. But you still should be able to get pretty close, even if you use the decimal version. Okay, the whole bunch. I don't even remember doing this many things. I'm guessing maybe your homework had a bunch of them. Um, but there's a bunch of problems with the harmonic motion, a bunch of them. They're easy, so it's not a bad thing, but, <laughs> but there are like four of them on this review, okay? Which means you're probably gonna get at least one of them, right? For sure, maybe even two of them on the test. But they do tell me to find the simple harmonic motion. There's a sine and a cosine, okay? They tell me that the displacement is um, zero when T is zero. And they tell me that the amplitude is five and the period is two, okay? Amplitude already tells me the number that goes in front, right? And the period will help me figure out the omega, but it doesn't give me the omega right away, okay? And this displacement, because it's zero when t is equal to zero, it's supposed to be a sine function. If this number right here were not zero, if that were five, when t is zero, then it would be a cosine function, okay? Because remember the sine waves and the cosine waves. The sine wave starts at the origin and then does the wavy, right? The cosine graph starts up at one and then does the wavy, okay? So when your x value or your t value is zero, if the y value is zero, then you're starting at the origin, which means it's sine. But if the y value is, is the amplitude, you're not doing sine. You're starting up here, which means you're doing cosine, okay? 
but this one does have zero, so it know it's not D. So I know that A and D are outruled right here, these two. This one has the wrong amplitude and that one has the wrong function. I just don't know which one of these omegas are supposed to be the correct omega. Now, I do know that if your period is two, in order for you to find the omega, you just do two pi over P. It's the same formula. If P is equal to two pi over omega and you flip it all around, you get the same function for omega, okay? You multiply both sides by W and then you divide by P, right? You get this equation. So I put the two for the period, I canceled those two and I figured out that omega was gonna be pi. So now I know the number that goes in front of the T. And this happens to match option C, okay? The next one literally just asked me for the maximum displacement. And as long as you remember that the maximum displacement is your altitude or your amplitude, sorry, then you know the answer to this one. And my amplitude's right there, isn't it? So that's the answer, it's just one half, okay? So if they ask you for max displacement, it's just this number in the front. Even if this is a negative, it's the positive of that value, okay? And then the next one asked me for the period of this, um, what is it, simple harmonic motion? <laughs> so they give me the function and they're asking me for the period. We already know how to do period. It's two pi over omega. In this case, omega is 18, right? So we get this as our period. Even if they ask me for the frequency, Remember that frequency is one over your period, which basically means the reciprocal of the period. So notice omega's on top now and the two pi's on the bottom. Omega here though is six pi, isn't it? So it's pi in the top, two pi at the bottom, and then you get that three, okay? So all four of those have to do with simple harmonic, but they're not very complicated, right? As long as you remember those little tiny pieces of info like this, and this formula and this formula, you should be good, okay? Now, number 20, what does number 20 ask us? 20, 20 says, use the given values to evaluate three trigonomic functions, sine, cosine, and tangent. And so what they've given me is that secant x equals four and that sine is greater than zero. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of these problems were problems that were on the tests, right? And that's because I put them on there on purpose on your test. So that way you've seen them before, before you see them on the final, okay? So now that we're seeing this review, if you go to all your tests, they look a lot like those problems on the test. There might be a couple of them in there that are not on your test, but they're the homework, okay? But for the most part, all these problems were on your test. This exact problem was on your test. Okay, so secant x equals four is the same as saying one over cosine equals four. And if I cross multiply and do all the dividing and stuff, or if I just reciprocate this and reciprocate this, I'll get this equation here, okay? So if I flip this one over, I get cosine. And if I flip four over one over, don't I get one fourth, right? So I have one of those functions, but I don't have sine and tangent, okay? So I'm gonna use this to create a triangle. That way I can go get sine and tangent. So this is the adjacent and this is the hypotenuse. So when I created my triangle, I put my angle X there and then I made the adjacent the one and the hypotenuse the four. To figure out the opposite side, I did the Pythagorean theorem. So it's hypotenuse squared minus the leg squared and I got square root of 15. It doesn't simplify. But remember, your opposite side describes the sine function, doesn't it? And it told me at the very beginning that my sine was greater than zero, which means when you write this square root of 15, you need to choose the positive square root of 15. If this had said sine was less than zero, then I would have had to have choose the negative square root of 15, okay? But it is greater, so I chose the positive square root of 15. Then to do the sine, it's opposite over hypotenuse, so square root of 15 over four, and then for tangent, opposite over adjacent. So square root of 15 over one, which is just square root of 15. And the one that had all three of these responses 
was B. Okay. This one's a nightmare. <laughs> I'm gonna show you their picture because their picture is better and then it'll make my picture make some sense, okay? So 21 was this picture, so much nicer than mine, I know, but I try. Um, but it's basically this situation. So you're at the lighthouse, there's an angle of uh, decline for here to get to that first ship, the furthest ship, and then another angle of decline to get to the closest ship, right? And what they're asking me is how far apart are the ships? And they don't mean from the front end to the, to the or the back end to the front end. They mean from front end to front end, okay? Um, so I tried to draw it without the ships. So I just put dots for my ships. So this was like my first ship in the front, and then this was my back ship. And I just drew two triangles and it just somehow came out like this, okay? <laughs> so let me write all of this down. So this is my lighthouse. And we were told that that was 340 feet tall. And then this, because it's a vertical here, I did put my right angle box, right? Now I did trace, I basically made a big giant rectangle. So from this corner to this corner, I just connected the dots to make a big rectangle, okay? So if you notice, now I have this big rectangle, right? And of course, if I cut off this triangle, I were to go straight up, this is 340 feet, that's 340 feet, and this is 340 feet, right? Aren't they all the same, okay? And so what I tried to do is I tried to create two different triangles, one in pink and one in green, okay? The one here in pink is this one, okay? What I'm trying to figure out is how far these two guys are. So my strategy was if I can figure out what this um, measurement is and I can figure out what this measurement is, then I just need to subtract them, right? To get that shorter measurement. So I created a triangle here and this triangle has an angle here, 6.5 degrees, and an angle here, which I don't know what it is, and then this right angle right here in the corner. And so then I do know that this is 340 degrees. So I tried to use that to figure out this side up top. See this side up here? Isn't it going to be the same measurement as this one down here? It's a rectangle, right? So whatever's up there is going to be the same as down here. So I tried to figure out what that one was going to be. And so what I did was I used the 340 and this angle and the Y and this angle to figure that out. Okay. Now, in order for me to figure out this angle right here, I had to do 180 minus the 90 degrees minus the 6.5 degrees. And I figured out that that angle right there was 83.5 degrees. Then from there, I did the law of sines. So I did the sine of this angle over that measurement, who knows what it is, is equal to the sine of 6.5 degrees and this measurement 340. Now I do know what alpha is. Um, it looks like I cross multiplied. So I cross multiplied and then divided by this. And that's where this came from. I plugged in my alpha because I did figure it out. And then I typed all of that in my calculator and I got this big number, okay? That was helpful. So I now know this length. Now I'm gonna look at the green thing. And the green triangle is like the whole rectangle, okay? So it's the whole rectangle and you're essentially looking at just this part, okay? So you're just looking at that triangle, part of the long rectangle, okay? I do know that that's 90 degrees. I do know that this little angle up here is four degrees, but I don't know what this angle is, right? But it's not too hard to figure out. You just do 180 minus the 90 minus the four, and you'll figure out what this little angle is, okay? But I want to know what this measurement is in that top triangle, because that measurement, it's a rectangle, is going to be the same as this measurement, okay? So I wanna figure out what this thing is here. And I can do that. 
I can say um, that the sine of four degrees over 340 is equal to the sine of this angle over that side, which is X, okay? And then if I cross multiply, right, and don't, I get this, okay? Then I plugged in what the beta was because I just found it. And then I typed all of that in my calculator and I got this huge number. So if I wanna know the distance between the two, I gotta take how far that one is minus how far this one is. And that's the computation I did here. And I ended up with this, which rounded out to that. And that actually was option A. Now this one, you really cannot guess because look at all those answers. They're all pretty darn close to each other. So it's not like one of them is just absurdly out of left field, okay? You really have to go through all of those steps, okay? Um, Self-strategy. If I were taking this final, I would leave this one and that partial diffraction decomposition for last. I'd be like, nope, I'm gonna do those later if they're on the test, okay? Just don't stress yourself out too much. You wanna make this smooth, okay? Okay, let's see, I need to zoom out just a tiny bit because I can't see the whole problem. There we go. So this one says, find an algebraic expression that is equivalent to this expression. Now this one is basically the same as that other problem that you did in your calculator. You remember the one that said tan sine inverse of five over 13 and it came out to 512? This is the exact same problem, you just can't use a calculator. Okay, so I showed you the long way to do that problem, right, for a reason. Because in case it's not numbers, it's X's or whatever letter, you could still do it. Okay, so let's go to the paper. So they're telling me this, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that that's the same thing as saying secant of an angle, where this is equal to that angle, right, because I just replaced it with the theta, okay. So that means that theta has to equal the arc 10. But if I don't want to write arc 10, I can move it to the other side and it'll become regular 10, right? And now I have this expression. If I make it a fraction, it'd be 4x over 1, which would be my opposite 4x and my adjacent would be 1, okay? And so that's the triangle I created here. I made the adjacent a 1 and the opposite 4x. Then if I do my Pythagorean theorem to figure out the hypotenuse, it's one leg squared plus the other squared, I get this expression, okay? And if I'm trying to find secant of this angle, I would be looking for the hypotenuse over the adjacent. Well, the hypotenuse I now know is this expression, right? And the adjacent is the one. So that's the one down there. And if you have something over one, you don't need to fraction, right? It's just square root of 16 x squared plus one. And that one did match uh, option A, okay? So it is helpful to know how to do it this way, even on the problem with the numbers. You just get lucky if they're numbers because you can put it in your calculator, okay? What if, um, sure. what if 4X was on the If it was here, the other way around? Yeah. All that would happen is that these would be switched. Yeah. And then this would have 16X squared plus one over, 4x would it end up and you wouldn't do anything with it just leave it alone yeah okay this next ones are all the ones that everybody loves right <laughs> the the identity ones the verifying stuff y'all's your favorite right <laughs> um so these are all just that there there's so many different identities i'm gonna try to like explain which ones i used but it's hard so the first thing I do whenever I have fractions is I split that fraction into the numerator times one over whatever the denominator is, okay? So I took this fraction sine over tangent and I split it to sine times over tangent. And then this, I used one of those quotient identities. That is the same thing as saying cotangent, right? And then I noticed that cotangent can be written as cosine over sine and um, the signs actually cancel. And so you're just left with cosine. I think this was one of the ones on the test, if I remember correctly, okay? Then this one, I don't think we did have on the test, but I did the same strategy, okay? 
I took the numerator here and I multiplied it by one over whatever was in the denominator, okay? Then instead of one over secant, that's the thing as saying, excuse me, cosine. Those are those reciprocal identities, right? Cosine and secant are reciprocals of one another. Then I multiplied this, this, and this together and I got this numerator and then this is my denominator, right? And cosine over sine is the same as cotangent, okay? But I noticed that in all the options, none of them had negative 9x, none of them. I'll go look, show it to you. Where's the number 24? 24. Oh, there's two of them, but do they have cotangent? No. The ones that do have cotangent didn't have a negative, okay? So what I had to do is I had to use one of the um, even and odd identities, okay? And in the even and odd identity, it does say that for cotangent, you can take the negative out, but it goes to the front, okay? And when you take that out, then that makes the eight become a negative, doesn't it? And so this was the final answer, okay? So just be careful. The only one that doesn't negative out is cosine. If I were to do cosine of negative 9x, it's just cosine of positive 9x. They're the same, okay? This. If you have a negative number, it's the same as cosine of the positive number. But if you're talking about sine, it's going to turn it into a negative sine, and then the angle stays positive. And if you're talking about tangent, if you do a negative number on the end here, it can come out as a negative in the front. And so the same thing works for secant would stay. The negative just basically disappears for secant as well. For cosecant, the negative will go to the front. And for cotangent, the negative will go to the front, OK? Because having a reciprocal is not going to change the sign. If the number was negative, even when you flip it over, it's still negative, OK? OK. I'm trying to at least get through. What's half of 55? 26, 27, something like that, 7.5. So if we can get through at least this page, <laughs> then that will save us for the next class to go over all the rest of them, okay? Um, but we definitely need to get through at least this page, okay? So next up on the list is a... This one is a multiple choice because I think there's one that's not. So this one does say find an expression equivalent to it and I will show you how to do that. This one's multiple choice, multiple choice. I could have sworn there was one that this one is the one that's not, okay? So there is one. I don't think you're gonna have this because all the problems on the test on the final are multiple choice. So chances are you're not gonna have that one, okay? I'll go over it, but we're not, I don't think you're gonna have that on the test. So here's 25. So I took this that they gave me. And the first thing I did was use the Pythagorean identity since sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. If I minus this over there, I figured out that cosine squared x is one minus sine squared x, right? And so instead of writing cosine squared, I wrote one minus sine squared. But then I factored this because it is the difference of two squares, right? Don't you have a difference, a perfect square and a perfect square, okay? So the square root of one is one and one, and the square root of sine squared is sine and sine. And one should have a minus and one should have a plus. And if you notice, your denominator matches one of those factors, okay? And so those cancel out and you're just left with this factor, which was one minus sine x. And so that was option C, okay? This was another one that was on your test. Now here, we've got some equations. We're starting to get an equation. So you're asking me about that unit circle. You can draw one or you can print one, whatever you wanna do. You could figure out how to get a unit circle on there, but you will probably need it <laughs> for sure unless you're one of those that's doing backward stuff and just checking all the answers, right? Okay. Um, but they do give us this equation. It is already factored, so I don't need to do anything there. All I need to do is just set each factor equal to zero, okay? When I set this factor equal to zero, that means the y value on the unit circle is gonna be zero. 
That happens in two different places here on my unit circle. It happens here at zero, and then it happens here again at pi, okay? So that means if I put those together, it would be zero plus pi n, okay? Or just pi n all by itself, and I noticed that they like to write n pi. It's the same thing, right? Okay, now this other equation is a little bit different. I had to minus five, and then I had to divide by five. So I got sine of x equal to negative one. On the unit circle, sine is the y value. So I had to look where the y value was negative one, which is down here at three pi over two, okay? And so it's the only one. So it would be three pi over two plus two pi n, or they like to put the n in front of the pi. So that's three pi over two plus two pi n. So you're gonna pick the answer that has this and this, okay? And that was option C. There's a whole bunch of them in there, but you're looking for this one, three pi over two, and then in pi, okay? The last one, it doesn't ask me for all the solutions. It asks me only for the solutions on the unit circle, okay? So I don't need to do the n pi or two pi, all of that. We don't have to do that. But this one was also on the test. So you had this. And you have to remember that when you're solving nonlinear equations, the only way to solve nonlinear equations is to get it equal to zero and then factor it and then set each factor equal to zero, which is exactly what we did here, but it was already equal to zero and it was already factored. We just did the last step, right? This one, we have to do the whole thing. So the first thing is I have to get it equal to zero. So I minus the five tan x to the left side, okay? Then I have to factor this. So I noticed that they had a five tan x in common, both of those two terms, this guy, this guy. But when I factored the five tan x out, I ended up with three and then tan x squared and then a minus one. And if you're not sure if you factored it correctly, always distribute and make sure you get the same two terms, right? As long as it multiplies out to what you had, you know you factored it correct, okay? Once I had that factored, I went ahead and set each factor equal to zero. So the five tan x equal to zero, and then the three tan x squared minus one equal to zero. For here, I divided by five, so I got tan x by itself is equal to zero over five, or tan x just equals zero. Understand that you can write that as a fraction, but would it matter what sign was in the denominator, right? If I have zero over positive one, it's zero. If I have zero over negative one, it's also still zero, okay? So that's why you see the plus or minus right there because both of these options will still give me a zero fraction, okay? So then that means, remember what tangent is. Tangent is sine over cosine, isn't it? So that means that the sine would have to equal the zero and the cosine would have to equal positive or negative one, okay? So that means where's the y value equal to zero? The y value is equal to zero here and here, right? Which is zero and pi. And at the same time, the cosine of x has to equal negative one. Doesn't this cosine x value equal one and that cosine x value equal negative one, right? And so it's the same two numbers, okay? You're looking for the angle that has both of these criteria. Or the other side, we took the one and we added it over. We took the three and we divided it down here. Then I took the square root. But when you take the square root of both sides, you get plus or minus. So I have plus or minus, the square root of one is one and the square root of three does not reduce. But I did rewrite this because there's no one and square root of three on that unit circle. There's one half and square root of three over two on the unit circle. So instead I wrote this as one half over square root of three over two. Is that equivalent to one over square root of three? It is, the twos actually just cancel each other out. It rationalized me, but let's go check out what this is by itself without putting all the fractions in there. It's the same thing, isn't it? Okay. 
So I threw in the halves because I knew that's what's on the unit circle, okay? So this is equivalent to this. Remember, the top is the sine and the bottom is the cosine. And it could be plus or minus, any sine combination. So you're essentially looking for all points that have a one half or a negative one half, and in that same point have square root of three over two, whether it's positive or negative, okay? And there were four points that had those two numbers for the X values and the Y values, okay? And it was these guys here on the unit circle. So all six of these answers should be on your final answer, and that's option C, okay? It's a lot, I know. But where is it? And you gotta be very, look at the, a lot of these look the same down here. So be very, very careful. It's actually this one. Pi over six, five pi over six, seven pi over six, and 11 pi over six. Don't be too quick, because you'll see like a bunch of them in there that are yours, but then there's somebody else extra in there that's not the correct answer, okay? So just be very, very careful when you look at those um, solutions. These are definitely not it because it said between zero and two pi. So it should not be any ends anywhere. Okay, well, we made it through half. Um, the second half is one, two, three, eight more pages. So we made it through 10 pages. The second half is only eight pages. So it might go a little bit faster. When I post it, I'm going to post the entire document, okay? So you'll have a video from today's class with me talking everything out, but the document's going to have all the solutions from one all the way to 55, okay? And then on Thursday, um, I'll record going over the other half of the problems, okay? If you choose to not come to class, because there's a couple people that left, they probably figured, well, she's going to record it. <laughs> it's all posted later and they just walked out. That's totally fine. Just make sure that you actually watch the videos if you need to. If you're looking at those solutions and they're not making sense, watch part of the video so you can get those solutions explained. Okay. Does that make sense? If anything else, I hope to see you on Thursday. If not, I'll see you when you take the final. <laughs> Whether it's online, I see you in the camera or you come to class and I see you in class. Okay, but you guys have a good day.